Great. So, Kat, hi, how's it going? Hi, good, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, I'm good. It's um, rainy and cold and maybe a little snow on the way, but it's good weather to talk about what it's like to be outside all summer at Milford Point. Um, remind me, your, your title is, you're the Coastal Ranger? Yeah, my title is, I guess is a little bit longer than that. It's the Milford Point IBA Coastal Ranger. So in short, Coastal Ranger of Milford Point Audubon Center. And um, tell me what that means. What do you do? So um, as a Coastal Ranger, we have some basic um, type of duties, which means that we are um, interacting with the public, which this year obviously was a little bit different due to COVID. So we're interacting with the public just to make them aware of what an IBA is. So the important birding area, explaining to them that our nesting shorebirds, exactly what they are doing. So having nests, raising young, um, but not only just interacting with the public, I'm doing the legwork as well. So I'm assisting with putting up the symbolic string fences. I'm installing nest exclosures when they are deemed necessary. I am counting and reporting data. So counting chicks, counting nests, um, pretty much the first one to be able to spot anything that's going on there. But then there were some additional duties that I did this season, which was a little bit different. I helped monitor predator um, activity that was going on in the spit since we unfortunately were not able to exclose as quickly as possible. So I installed trail cameras that allowed us to exactly monitor what was going on with our nests and why they were disappearing. Um, terrific, that's interesting. You have maybe 10 or 15 minutes worth of slides to show. Yes, um, yeah. Why don't we start with that and then okay. I'll ask some questions maybe as we go along and then a couple to sum up. All right, great. great. Let me show my slides. All right. Okay, so just briefly, as we mentioned, this is about the Milford Point Audubon Center. So it's the little spit that goes out towards Long Island Sound. And I am Katarina Gillis, the IBA Coastal Ranger. Here you can actually see one of our piping plover chicks. This photo was taken by uh, Patrick and um, really cute there. For those of you that aren't too familiar with Milford Point, uh, Milford Point, the coastal center, we aim to promote the awareness and preservation of Long Island Sound's ecosystem and the birds and habitat that it supports. Visitors to the center have access to the sound and to the tidal salt, salt marshes barrier beaches, tide pools, and coastal dunes. So we have a lot of diverse habitats, all of which um, need to be protective in order to preserve it. Okay, so this year with COVID really presented some unique challenges for us and some disturbances. So although everyone um, was supposed to be quarantined quarantining in their home. That exactly did not happen this year on the uh, beach. We saw an increased amount of visitors, including photographers who are new to the area, new to birding photography, which is great. That's awesome. We'd love to see um, people really get into our birds because that, that builds that kind of relationship with us. Um, but a lot of people that were unaware of the area and our birds and our fences, a lot of increase in dogs this season, not only dogs, but unleashed dogs, which become dangerous for our birds, but also predation. So we did see um, one fox family in particular, they had five kits this season. So that was seven foxes at, at one time on the beach, which uh, causes a lot of pressure on our birds and predation as well. Just going on about what I was saying, um, we also saw a cat this year that we never had previously seen on the property. He was an uh, intact male cat and um, he, he caused some ruckus along with on the right there, just a, a lady walking her dog leashed, but right past that yellow sign, that yellow sign says no dogs on the spit area from April, April to September. So although 
we put up signs, you know, people choose to keep going with their dog. So that just is something that we see regularly, but with people home, everyone wanted to exercise their dog a little bit more. Predation. So like I had talked about just a little bit, um, I did some unique trail cam work. That's kind of my master's background. So I installed about five cameras throughout the dunes and on the spare area. And I was able to capture a um, good amount of species there. Here you can see the red fox. This is actually the mother of the five kits I mentioned. And you can see them down there on the uh, bottom left corner. Um, and once they were old enough to hunt on their own, that's when we saw an increase in predation and nest loss on the spit. Kat, that, re that reminds me, I forgot to ask about your academic work. Before you go on, tell us um, where you're studying and what. Yeah, so I am on my last uh, semester, last season at Central Connecticut State University. My master's is in wildlife biology and conservation. So I set up trail cameras throughout the state of Connecticut to uh, monitor distribution and occupancy of Fisher. So Pecania penanti, which is a, a type of weasel here that we have native to Connecticut. So that is my background. A lot of camera work. Um, the the closed captioning really mangled the scientific name of the <laughs> Fisher. It's just so anybody who's reading this knows that um, yeah, uh, whatever so, it was that it, it, whatever it was that printed out is not what uh, what the name is. Sure anyway, you, that sounds pretty interesting. And maybe um, once you get your master's, we could do another uh, uh, interview and and slideshow about that. But yeah, so, that would be awesome. Get, get back to um, Milford Point and the plovers and oyster catches. All right. So with COVID presenting those challenges that I had mentioned, we decided to take unique um, approach to protecting our birds. So due to COVID, when we set up exclosures, it's usually um, three, a three person to four person job. And we're usually very close to each other and, and on top of each other. Usually two people are digging around where we're gonna place the exposure. And then another two people are holding and assembling the stakes. So we had to maintain our social distancing to, to remain safe. So the state, the DEP, was able to come up with a protocol in order to keep us safe, which was uh, just two people putting up the exclosure and maintaining that six foot distance at all time. So one person was on the opposite side of the exclosure working, which made it a little bit more difficult because um, as you can see, the sand at Milford Point, very shelly, very rocky course, hard to get into. So with two people digging and setting up the exclosure, takes a little bit more time than we would like. So increased protections included closing our parking lot for July 4th. Can, which, can I go back to the, the yeah. exposures? The, you, you wait until you find a nest before you, a piping plover nest before you put the exposure up, is that right? Yes, so um, the minimal requirements is that there's a three egg piping plover nest first, um, and then we go ahead and set up the exclosure um and it's usually under i think five minutes is the time that we have to set up that exposure without disturbing them and then we step back to a safe distance and observe to make sure that they sit back on their nest and incubate properly before we go ahead and call it a success right okay yeah um just so, like so everybody I, knows i turned off the closed captioning because it was just too <laughs> ridiculous okay so we'll just try to speak clearly yeah, so as I mentioned, we closed July 4th, which actually um, decreased a lot of beach presence that we normally have. Um, Cedar Beach and other private properties were absolutely packed and luckily that did not affect us. We had increased presence on Memorial Day. So we had about four people making sure that we're um, just observing our birds, making sure no one was causing increased um, disturbance a partial marsh closure during busy breeding time. So let me just explain that. So I wish I had a map here. If you go out onto the spit, there's the left side where it's the ocean side, and then there's the right side, which is the marsh side. 
So that marsh side, um, I was able to place a fence with a protective sign because that is exactly where the piping plovers and the American oyster catchers were corralling their chicks to safety. That's where they felt the most safe and being able to close that marsh side so people could not walk up and down that right side really gave them a, a break from the disturbance, the people walking around the spit, jogging around the spit. So they were protected on that side. So as I mentioned, exclosures were installed on all re-nests. That was another thing. Usually we install the exclosures on their first nest, but unfortunately with COVID, we had to stall and we only did re-nests this season. And then there was me, the full-time coastal ranger. So I was there about six days a week, um, 45 hours roughly. So I had a lot of time to make sure that our birds were thoroughly protected this season. So our results, so a little lower than we would like, a little lower than our numbers last season. So this season we had 13 breeding pairs, active breeding pairs. We had 78 eggs laid total with 26 nest attempts. So that's an average of two nests for every pair. 16 eggs hatched, but we only had eight fledged, which is down from the 24 piping plover fledges we had last season. And we believe that that is due to COVID and us not being able to properly exclose um, the nests quickly enough in combination of the higher predation that we saw. So this really just shows how important it is to be able to put up those protections in, in a timely manner. Another thing that I was able to do this season was use my mapping skills to be able to map all of our nests to really show what was going on on the spit from a visual perspective. And for every red dot that you see there with the bird, that's a failed nest. And as mm. you can see, there are a lot more failed nests than there were active nests at some points in time. Um, um, let me interrupt again. Can, can you orient us and, and show on the screen where the Coastal Center building is? Yeah, let me see. Okay. Um, the Coastal Center building is actually right there. Right there, okay. Yeah, so, you so know, that, you walk that, down that, here onto the boardwalk and then you hit the beach. So if you took a right, that'd be the private property area. But if you take a left and you, you go around, this is our main beach area that we have right here going down this way. So um, the X'd out portion is the fence area, obviously. So that's where our protections were. We had a lot more nests, um, fences this year because we had a lot more scattered nests than we normally do. So um, those were fenced. And then, like I said, the red was the, the failed nest that we saw this season. Okay. So on to the American oyster catcher results. They actually had a really good time this season. Probably one of the highest numbers that we've seen at Milford Point for quite some time. We had three breeding pairs this season. 12 eggs were laid, four nest attempts, and five hatched and four fledged. So that's pretty good to have five eggs hatch out and have four fledglings after that. So that were some high results that we saw there. On to the American Oyster Catcher Rescue. So this was probably one of the most exciting things that we saw this season. Um, Patrick Homans and I had actually noticed that one of the oyster catcher chicks, some of the last ones to fledge, had some type of monofilament wrapped around its neck. So not exactly um, fishing line, but it was some sort of plastic that was really tightly wound around its head and then its neck there. So what we were able to do, I called Beth Amendola, which is the National Audubon's oyster catcher technician. She was able to rush down within the hour 
and then Stefan Martin and Patrick Comins also reported, we were able to put down a type of um, a trap, which call, is called like a noose carpet, which basically takes line. And as the oyster catcher runs through it, it grabs onto their legs. So we were able to catch this bird within 15 minutes of laying the carpet down. And within another five minutes, we were able to tend to it, make sure that it was healthy and remove the monofilament around its neck. Luckily, there were no injury to the bird. It was pretty superficial, but it was starting to restrict the more that the bird grew. So it created a pretty dangerous situation for the bird. And I'm, I'm glad that we were able to notice it and really remove that before anything actually happened to the bird health-wise. Okay, so as I mentioned, the bird was in good condition and measurements were within the average range within a weight of 325 grams. As you can see on the left, that photo is actually a better picture of the bird with the plastic wrapped around its neck. That's really hard to see when chicks are moving around very quickly and we're you know, trying to observe them but not get too close to them as well. So we're not exactly sure how long that um, monofilament was around its neck, but we predict that it wasn't more than probably a week or a couple of days that it was on there. Adult weight ranges from 500 to over 600 grams and the bird and its sibling was actually banned N29 and N28. And we hope to see them in the next couple of years come back to Milford Point. We also had some least turn chicks this season. We had a handful of chicks fledge, which is great. Those are usually very hard um, birds to protect because we can't expose them and they kind of go by their own rules. But we did have some success in having some least turn chicks Unfortunately, we had three common turn nests this season, but none of them were successful due to the abnormally high tides that we saw this season that unfortunately flooded out their nests and then they did not re-nest. Well, so I, I don't know if this is part of your, your presentation, but it's a good time for me to ask. Yeah. But, um, tell us about the piping plovers and oyster catchers that protected their nests from the high tide. Yeah, so that's also very interesting. We saw that two of our piping plover nests, one of which that was at the base of the spit. Let me see if I can just go back to the map so I can explain this better. So without it locking back up on me. Um, at the base of the spit here, you see, um, let me see, we had a nest that was exposed and the tide comes up very high at the breach there and this specific pair of birds had a four egg nest and they were successfully able to move two eggs away from where the tide was coming in so they pushed them out of the exposure and within two days those eggs those two eggs hatched we saw that happen again at the tip of the spit with another bird, they did not move them out of the exposure, I guess moving them about two feet um, closer away from the, the tide coming in and they were able to hatch as well. That also happened with the American oyster catcher pair. Actually the, the adults that hatched out those two chicks that I just talked about um, with the monofilament she actually, that was her second re-nest and the tide was actually hitting her as she was sitting on her eggs. She pushed out one egg that she deemed was not viable. And then the other two eggs she kept protecting, which is amazing to see a bird just sit there, you know, really getting hit by the waves, the high tide, and then having two successful fledges from that. So the, high, the tides were very high this season but some of our birds were able to overcome that, that challenge. That's an amazing story. The, the, the plovers sensed that the tide was gonna be unusually high, presumably they sensed it, and then they, they knew enough to move their eggs to a spot where they wouldn't be flooded. And the oyster catcher maybe just saw that the, the tide was coming up. And so she sat on two of the eggs that she wanted to protect. 
Yeah. And then one of the one of those birds was the bird that had the the net around its neck. Yes. Yeah. That actually was the two um, birds that fledged. So not only did they have a rocky start coming into this world, then they had some challenges with the monofilament. And, you know, they they really got lucky this season that we were able to watch this amazing story from start to finish and and watching them fledge and go off into migration was truly amazing to see. Uh, do you know how many years it takes before oyster catchers are ready to breed? Um, so it's about three years before they come back to exactly where they had hatched out. Okay, so it'll take a while. If those two banded birds are gonna come back, we yes, won't know it, for a few years. It'll take a while and we'll you know keep an eye out on their bands and see if it's a yellow band N28 and N29. Yes. Okay. All right, so that is the end of my presentation. Yeah, okay, I have some questions if I may. Um, yeah, of course. Really just, I think just one, and that was when um, the day that I went out and followed you and Stefan, um, I think it was back in early June, um, it was a period when um, it, you weren't really sure how the season was gonna turn out. And th it was, there was a lot, of, um, a lot of predation, a lot of nests that hadn't failed. Um, tell me, tell me about what those early days were like and what it was like for you as the person who was sort of in charge of helping protect them to come back every day and, th and see things go, seemed like in some cases almost disastrously wrong. That's actually a really great question that hits me <laughs> really hard. Um, just because this is my third year doing this, um, not exactly at Milford Point, my first year being full time at Milford Point. Um, and, you know, they say when you're working in science and you're working in animals, you, you can't get attached to them. But, you know, when you're spending so much time watching these birds lay their, their nests and having a hard time, that really does hit you a certain way. And you see these birds struggling um, with tide, with predation. And it's, it's hard to know that you have so many nests and then you come back the next day and you're missing half to three quarters of them and you have to start all over again. And, and that could get a little discouraging, especially with COVID and us not being sure how we exactly could protect these birds this season because exclosures are so crucial to creating a protective barrier against predation. If we couldn't do anything for the predation side, at least we can put up the exclosures and with that being in limbo, that really gets discouraging and the season becomes unknown. And, and at some points, I feel like you question, you know, I'm putting in so much work, but we're not seeing the results that we'd like. So it gets hard. It really gets hard. But, you know, when you see these birds every day, it gives you that push to, to work harder because you want to see them successful. And that's what we want to see at the Audubon. We wanna see these birds successful. And there are, you know, just days where you've gotta work that extra mile and make sure that the birds are thoroughly protected. Yeah, very interesting. And, and one of the things that we said at the end of this year, at the end of this breeding season was that the results this year and all the work that, that you and the others did at Milford Point and elsewhere really show the importance of the Audubon Alliance that when the Audubon Alliance is out there in full force, the piping plovers just have a better year uh, like they did two years ago. This year, the Audubon Alliance, because of COVID, couldn't, couldn't really um, do the protection work that it's done in the past. And the result was that um, the piping plover success rate, so to speak, was not as good as previous years. Uh, so let me, let me close with a, a, um, a question about what you know, regular everyday visitors to Milford Point and other beaches where they nest, where piping plovers nest, and um, what should they be keeping in mind for next year uh, in terms of their own behavior? That's a great question. So just some general things that we can follow is keeping your dogs off beaches where it says no dogs, you know, between April and September. Also, making sure that you give birds that you see and their chicks and the fences a really decent distance. So 
you know, when the birds are looking at you, even though you're not a predator, you're taking their eyes off of actual predation. So making sure that you're giving them a really good buffer space, keep moving and you don't really sit on them while they're on their nests so they're not disturbed is probably the best thing that we can do is giving them their space this next season. Terrific. One of the things we talked about at uh, Connecticut Audubon was a, um, a Zoom program on um, how, to, how to be able to photograph birds without disturbing them. I'm not sure what name we'd give it, but uh, that would be a, a good thing for, for people to know because um, obviously there are certain distances that you don't want to, you don't want to uh, encroach upon. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. With photographers, you know, I know everyone wants to get that perfect shot. It's a very competitive hobby. Everyone wants the best bird photo to share them on social media. And I can definitely appreciate that. Um, just we have to do it responsibly and making sure that, you know, we are actually caring for the birds we're taking photos of. And that's really what's important. Right. All right, Kat, terrific. This was um, a really good talk. I'm glad you made the time. And it sounds like it was a really interesting year. Yeah. And um, we'll see what happens next year. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sean. Take care.